Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to um, tonight's special virtual program. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Gustafson. Uh, I'm joining you from Turnstile Tours. Uh, we're so honored um, to be a part of tonight's program, um, marking a very important day today, but also sharing a story that um, I think a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with. Um, so we're going to dive into the program in, in just a couple of minutes, um, but we want to give people the opportunity to continue to join um, the program because we have a, a very, very large audience today, which is which is wonderful. So we, we want to thank you so much, and I want to give a special thanks um, to the uh, hosts of, of tonight's program um, we're going to learn more about, which is the uh, Navy League, New York Council, um, and the Transportation Institute. Um, while people are still joining, uh, just I want to note a couple of things um, for how you can uh, participate uh, in tonight's program. Uh, first of all, uh, we have um, closed captioning. Uh, so if you would like to turn the captions on or off, um, if you're joining us from your computer, um, you can click that down at the bottom of the screen uh, and we have automated captions. Um, they're just a little bit behind, um, uh, but uh, if you would like to use those, um, please uh, do so. If you're joining us with a tablet or uh, um, a mobile device, um, you may have to exit out of the session in Zoom. Um, and then uh, go into the settings and turn the captioning on or off, and then you can uh, log back in. Um, we have a couple people who are helping us behind the scenes tonight. Uh, so my colleagues Cindy uh, and uh, Stefan uh, are both producing. So uh, if you have any technical issues, um, feel free to uh, reach out to us in the chat. And also if you have any questions for tonight's panelists, any memories you would like to share, um, please, we're going to use the chat as our primary means uh, of communicating. Uh, so you can again find that button at the bottom of, of your screen. Um, just one thing to note in the chat uh, is if you would just like the panelists and your hosts to see it, uh, you can select all panelists. If you'd like everybody uh, who has joined us tonight um, to be able to see it, uh, just select all panelists um, and attendees. Um, but without uh, further ado, I, I want to welcome um, the folks who are going to be uh, introducing uh, tonight's program and um, we're again so grateful that they uh, helped pull this together. Um, so first I want to um, introduce um, Frank Russo, uh, who is uh, the president uh, of the Navy League uh, New York Council. So we'll just invite you to uh, turn on your screen, Frank. Thank you, Andrew. You got a lot of technology. Yeah. <laughs> First off, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, this is a solemn occasion today. We all, whether you were here in New York or elsewhere, we remember today, the events of today, and the effect that it had on our country. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us to look at a story that is very seldom told, and that's the maritime operations which help evacuate individuals from downtown with members of the, Mer of the Merchant Marine, Coast Guard, doing what they do best, helping others. I'd like to particularly thank all members of the New York Council and all members of the Navy League around the United States and around the globe who are joining us for tonight. We appreciate your attendance. I'd like to recognize and thank all members of the, of the maritime industry, as well as the sea services, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, who are joining us tonight. And in particular, I'd like to, to welcome those 9-11 survivors and those members of the public that are, on, that are listening today, who are keep, helping keep the memory of that day alive and not forget those events. I'd like to particularly say thank you to the Transportation Institution for your generosity and providing support for this program, which is allowing us to bring this to everyone free of charge and to Turnstile Tours for both producing and moderating tonight's event. Their work in arranging everything, arranging the panelists, and coordinating their efforts are well appreciated. So with that, 
I'd like to turn this over to Richard Berkowitz, a former member of the New York Council, we're proud to say, and currently Vice President for Pacific Coast Operations for the Transportation Institute. With that, Rich. Hi, uh, the Transportation Institute with offices in Seattle and Maryland conducts research and advocates for viable U.S. merchant marine and sound national maritime policies. We are honored to support the New York Council Navy League as it shares a relatively unsung part of the meritorious responses of that fateful day 19 years ago. When the Coast Guard emergency broadcast for all available boats rang out on the marine band waves, U.S. flag vessel operators and American merchant mariners unselfishly responded as they have on every occasion when called upon, whether in times of conflict or catastrophe. Since the very birth of our nation, thank you for joining us and recognizing their deeds today. Great, thank, thank you so much uh, to um, both of you, uh, Frank and, and Rich, for, for sharing those words. Um, and we, we have a really wonderful uh, panel of uh, speakers tonight who are going to, um, you know, really illuminate um, this story, which, which both of you referenced, um, the, the fact that this is sort of an, an untold story of uh, how we were so dependent upon the waterways of New York, which many New Yorkers don't think about in their daily lives. Um, we were so dependent upon them for the, um, uh, uh, for this um, boat lift that was done. And so um, tonight's conversation is going to be uh, in, in two parts. Um, so for the first part, we're going to uh, have a panel um, that uh, is consists of people on the civilian mariner side. And I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, and then for the second half, uh, we're gonna talk to our counterparts uh, on the Coast Guard side. So um, we, we have some really wonderful guests. So first of all, um, I want to um, invite uh, our first panelists, uh, who's, um, I'll invite all three of them to actually come on the screen. Um, but first I wanna introduce uh, Andrew McGovern, uh, who is from the uh, Sandy Hook Pilots Association. Um, but we'll also be joined uh, by Peter Johansson, who was the um, Director of Operations for New York Waterways, um, and also Frank Peters, uh, who was with the Staten Island Ferry. Andrew, how, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing today? Great, great. Um, so, Andrew, let's let's just start at the beginning. Tell us uh, a little bit um, about uh, the the prelude um, to to all of this um, and what your uh, involvement was in really. Obviously, this isn't something you could ever completely prepare for. Um, but tell us a little bit about um, what made the maritime industry well-equipped, um, you know, to deal with this challenge on September 11th? Well, the, uh, the maritime industry, part of your training um, to become a mariner is uh, a lot of it has to do with emergency situations. I mean, this is what you're taught to do. Uh, a lot of times, especially if you were offshore, I mean, you're the only one there, or you, or you are the cr and the crew. So you have to deal with whatever happens. So, I mean, it's not unusual for mariners um, to be very um, well equipped to handle, you know, stress and, and, and emergencies. Plus, you know, the law of the sea, every mariner is taught that, you know, you never ever leave somebody out there. You know, if somebody calls for help, you go. I mean, so that's, you know, I think that's just ingrained in every mariner. So, uh, so that, you know, that's, I guess, if you want to call it the real basis of, of, of why everything happened. Um, everything happened well, I think, because of uh, the fact that um, we've had a Harbor Safety Committee in, in the port for many years. Um, everyone, um, our members, uh, you know, including all the different uh, government agencies, 
we all work together. We had been working together for years before this happened. So we all knew each other. Um, so when things happened, I mean, it was a matter of, you know, just being able to talk to each other. Um, we all have complete trust in each other and, uh, it just, you know, it, it just happened. I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it was, I wouldn't say easy, but it was, it was, you know, it was a natural flow as to how things work out. And, uh, so it was, you know. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, where, where you were on, on that morning? I was actually on my way to the trade center. We had a, uh, Harvard safety committee meeting that morning, uh, Port Authority was hosting it. So I think we we're supposed to be on the 66th floor, maybe. Um, we, we, luckily we were starting at 10 o'clock and, uh, and not earlier than that. And, um, so, uh, you know, I realized things were going wrong. I, um, I called up the coast guard, uh, and, um, instead of going to the trade center, I went to, uh, the Coast Guard base on Staten Island, and uh, then we took it from there. We met up with uh, you know a lot of the people that you have on your panel for this uh, the second panel, and we uh, started putting things together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I want to bounce it over to to you, um, Peter. Uh, tell tell us a little bit uh, about what what we you what you were doing in the moment you know when this started to go down. Yes. Good morning. Oh, good, good afternoon. Um, I was actually, I was on one of our ferries going down the Hudson River on my way to a, a passenger vessel subcommittee meeting for the Harbor Safety Committee. And um, I was probably just uh, around where the Holland Tunnel is. And I was talking to the captain on the bridge when I looked over my left shoulder and I saw the first plane pass me on the left and go straight into the, uh, the North Tower. Uh, and it went in at an angle, and um, it, it, um, uh, you started seeing some smoke coming out of there. And you kind of like pinch yourself and say, was that, how big was that plane? Because you never see the perspective of um, uh, the, uh, the size. You never see a, a plane around big buildings like that. So anyway, we continued on. We were taking the passengers to Pier 11 for Wall, most of the Wall Street jobs. There was a hundred people on board and every one of them got off and went to work. Uh, we then took our empty ferry, which could take 150 people, came back around the tip of Manhattan and went to the, uh, the ferry terminal that was right next to North Cove Marina, just uh, to the riverside of the World Trade Center. And uh, when I got there, uh, it was packed. Uh, people were already starting to leave. Um, we have had a lot of, of uh, uh, experience dealing with any time, like the path went out, people would run to the ferries because they knew that was their way out. And uh, so people automatically went to the ferries. So when I got there, we loaded the ferry I was on and then I stayed there and I said, the most important thing I can do is do crowd control because if we get too many people on this barge, it's not going to be a good thing. In the meantime, I can let down as many as, as can go on the next ferry. Uh, so I stood at the top of, this, of the, uh, the ramp going down to the barge and I had a VHF and I was calling in the boats uh, as they were lining up out there. Um, and they were taking them to, uh, to either Weehawken or over to uh, Hoboken um, and some, some to Jersey City. So we just started uh, taking people out and our, our our ferries are front loading ferries. The gates open, people come in, you can load 400 people probably in two minutes. And, um, and then they, they pull out, the next boat comes in there. And it was very efficient. We were getting a lot of uh, people moving and um, people were great. People were very cooperative. Um, they were you know, good to each other. There was no pushing, no shoving, anything like that. And uh, you know, as I'm up there at the top, I, you know, I was letting the people on in that, but I could, I looked over my, my right shoulder and I saw the plane that was circling from the south come in and smash the, the south tower. And that was more spectacular because it was a big ball of flame. Uh, but that's the, that's the moment that you knew this wasn't a navigation uh, incident, that it was, you were under attack and changed the whole mood. Um, but here again, people were not, they didn't panic. They saw there was plenty of boats. They knew they were getting out. They stayed in line. Everything was good. 
and uh, we continued to load and um, and then at, at one point we heard you heard this rumbling it sounded like a jet engine next to you and um, that's when the first tower came down and when the first tower came down we were in the cloud and all the debris came blowing past us and we, we were just enough in the lee of the uh, mercantile exchange that we didn't get uh, hit by the debris but we got we were engulfed by the cloud uh, at that time the uh, the ferries uh, had to navigate with radar and uh, they we, we took all the people and said go up north on the seawall because the wind was coming from the from the northwest and we wanted to um, get them into fresh air and then we started bringing our front loaded ferries right up to the seawall and putting ladders up and uh, they were climbing down on the ladders um, when the air cleared sufficiently, we went back to the barge and continued to do loading on the barge because it was much safer. And then uh, uh, when this, after the second tower came down and we moved up the seawall, at that point, the, uh, the, the police there said, you gotta leave the area, everybody's gotta leave the area. And they just had everybody moving north. Um, and actually we then, uh, we went to some, some regular, uh, uh, piers that were for pleasure craft and we were doing some some more loading there and and then uh again they started moving people north of there so we we kept going the rest of the day uh we were most of the people went through the for terminal at 38th street um there were there were lines of people 20 blocks north 20 blocks south they were waiting four and five hours to get on a ferry uh but they were great and uh, they knew that you know at that point the tunnels were all closed the bridge the, the George Washington Bridge was closed uh, the path was underwater and uh, so the only way back to New Jersey was by uh, by boat and whether it be ferries or whether it be all the other boats that came to the rescue to the rescue when you saw the pictures of the people there on the bat on the battery um, but you know we 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 know that the, the safest way is to do it from uh, the regular ferry berths. And uh, it was no longer a matter of, of, of you know, time that they were in danger. It was now a matter of how, we, how can we get the most people through. And Peter, you know, you, you said you, you were counting every person that, that came on the ferry. Right. Uh, how many people do you estimate that, that you moved off, you know, just across the Hudson to, to New Jersey? But well, we, we estimated about 220,000. And that was through the, you know, up until the wee hours of the morning. Um, but on a normal day, our passenger load was 30,000 people. So it was an extraordinary, um, you know, jump up and, and, you know, we had 24 boats in operation that day. And um, they just kept going. And I want to bounce it over to Frank, because you were over on the other side of, of the tip of, of Lower Manhattan or um, uh, are, are coming out of there. Tell us a little bit about um, your, your experience and where you were in that moment. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a great story, Peter. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you, you meet a lot of people over the years and, and you hear different perspectives of what went on that day. And, and you just learn to appreciate just the great effort that went into that boat lift. I was a captain on the Staten Island Ferry, uh, captain of the John F. Kennedy, and I left St. George Terminal at 8.30 that morning. Uh, so uh, just about at the southern tip of uh, Governor's Island was when I saw the first explosion. I didn't see an airplane. I just saw the explosion through the building. So I called out to Vessel Traffic Services in New York and I told them I just saw a huge fireball explosion over the battery. Uh, I figured it might have been a helicopter collision because it's a heliport right there at the lower end of Manhattan. And the explosion was so large and it just appeared to be so much closer and I could see debris falling and I thought it was falling into the water off the battery. And um, they asked me to repeat my message. I repeated the message and then he said, I got it. And uh, what they had done is they had put the harbor cameras on the, on the towers to see, uh, you know, just to, for, for monitoring purposes uh, at their facility. I called Whitehall Terminal and I asked them if they knew anything about an explosion at the Twin Tower and, and the dispatcher said, no, uh, we, we haven't heard anything. 
I said, well, look out the window. There's a huge fire in, in one of the, the towers. And then somebody transmitted on the radio that uh, a plane had struck the building. So at this time, we thought it was just a tragic accident. You know, uh, a plane flew into the, one of the towers. And, you know, how could that happen? Uh, we had no idea it was a jumbo jet. But we proceeded to Whitehall and we uh, offloaded all our passengers. At that time, the Staten Island Ferry was carrying cars. So we got all the cars off. And at the time they started loading the ferry, I'm, I'm looking out of the wheelhouse into the terminal. The second plane comes from behind and flies right over the, the terminal, right into the second tower. I, I just heard this, this extremely loud noise. I literally spun around in the proud house and I was like, what was that? And then I got a call from the assistant captain at Squire at the other end of the ferry he said that the second tower was just hit, a plane just flew into the second tower. And um, then I had a, I heard a radio transmission from the ferry new house, which was directly behind me. And they said that they also reported that a uh, the second tower was hit and that they were going to turn around and bring their passengers back to Staten Island. The new house ferry can carry 6,000 people. We were, we were bringing people to work that morning. So he had close to 4,000 people on board. He didn't think it was a good idea to drop them off at the battery. At that point, I realized that I was, I was the only show in town as far as the Staten Island Ferry was concerned um, to get people off the island. I was scheduled to make a nine o'clock trip out of Manhattan. Passengers started running back to the ferry in a panic and the mate was trying to get him to close the gates. So I, I just told him, listen, Something very bad is happening. Uh, we're going to take as many people as we possibly can, and we're not leaving until people stop coming. And it, it was very interesting that people stopped coming after about 10 minutes. And I think the, curio the curiosity factor took over. You know, went from a moment of panic and and uh, retreat to uh, you know what's going on here. Uh, we closed the gates, we steered away from the terminal, and then you got to see the visual of the both towers, you know, engulfed. And uh, we went back to Staten Island. Uh, we were told that ferry uh, passenger service has been suspended, and our job now is to transport emergency services into Manhattan. And after we drop off the emergency uh, service personnel to take any passengers in the terminal back to Staten Island. Um, we didn't see uh, a, a great deal of many, we didn't see many people uh, coming back to Staten Island, only a couple hundred at a time. I think because uh, the, the, the dust cloud settled down into the battery, you probably saw more activity on the Hudson River seawall, uh, people moving north and trying to get away from, from the uh, smoke. And, but when we got back to Staten Island uh, and we were waiting to get underway, I was in the New York pilot house and I got, I saw the first tower drop and saw how the, from my perspective, how the whole uh, dust cloud set toward the Hudson River and then the west winds took it back over to Brooklyn, but it totally obscured uh, lower Manhattan from our view. Uh, and Governor's Island was even, you know, all you could see was the southern tip. And for the rest of the day, we just transported uh, emergency service personnel. We were assigned Coast Guard personnel to every vessel. Uh, interesting is that the firefighters, we, we would transport a couple hundred firefighters responding from their homes in Staten Island. Uh, they came to the ferry and they, they started asking us for uh, firefighting equipment. You know, they wanted, they probably stripped all our fire access off the boat. But the, you know, the Coast Guard said, that's okay, you know, it's an emergency. Uh, there's a famous uh, picture of a firefighter kneeling in a debris with it with an axe. You've probably probably seen that. And on that axe, you can see Governor Herbert H. Lehman, which was one of our ferry boats. Wow! So, wow! Yeah, um, we uh, we were told to make out uh, our incident reports of the day, and you know, I I tried to document as best I could uh, everything that happened that morning. But it was it was a horrible, horrible tragedy. Yeah. Well, you know, both you, Frank, and, and you, Peter, you know, shared how, you know, resources were, were mobilized um, in this moment. Um, 
Andrew, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how your organization, um, the Sandy Hook Pilots, uh, mobilized um, to help with the response um, after you started to figure out what, what exactly was going on. Well, uh, and yeah, that's it. I mean, I headed over towards the Coast Guard after the first plane hit and uh, being your typical commuter, I was listening to um, the traffic reports and uh, I had CBS News on and they have a traffic report on, on the eights every eight, you know, eight minutes, 18 minutes, et cetera. And uh, their helicopter guy said, oh, uh, you know, I'm flying around the Trade Center. I don't have a tracker report because um, they said a plane hit the Trade Center. And uh, and he was literally circling it in his helicopter, the first plane. And he said, oh, it must have been a small plane because it didn't come out the other side. And at, and as even Peter said before, you know, everyone figured that first one was an accident. So, you know, but I knew that, I knew the emergency response plan with the city was to use the battery tunnel and the and the Staten Island Ferry to bring equipment from the other boroughs into lower Manhattan if anything happened down there. So I uh, called up the Coast Guard and um, talked to the people that were going to come to the Harbor Safety Committee and asked them if they had left yet. And they said no. So I said, well, you know what, let me, I'm just coming up on the Verrazano Bridge. I'll come into, I'll come to Manhattan. I'll come over to, uh, to uh, Staten Island and then we'll figure out how to get there from, from there. Uh, Cause we were still planning on going. And by the time I got over the bridge and got to the, um, Coast Guard base, I was met at the door by uh, Mike Day, um, who was like, just come in, we're not going, just come in. So we went up to the uh, Vessel Traffic Center and the CAC, and uh, he said, you know, another plane hit, and this is, you know, this is not, you know, this is an attack. So, you know, we started talking. Um, our pilot boat, the pilot of New York, uh, was just came out of shipyard, was already uh, to go, I called down there and said, you know, fire it up. We'll be coming down with some Coast Guard people in a few minutes. And we started talking and we started getting people together. Uh, Dan uh, Ronan was in charge um, of waterways at the time. So he, uh, you know, he picked people, we had volunteers. We put people together on the ferry, uh, I mean, on the pilot boat. Um, we had talked about different plans that we had uh, because you know you, you make plans, everything. A lot of things go on in this port. Um, a lot of uh, captains of the port they come in, they all have a have a nightmare scenario. And um, Admiral uh, Larrabee, who was a former captain of the port, um, had a nightmare scenario. It was after those the first new ferries were brought in, those six thousand passenger ferries that Frank just talked about. And um, God, what if one of those was hit? Uh, you know, in March or February and uh, you know you've only got a few minutes to get people out of the water before hypothermia how are we going to get all those people out of the water well one of the things we talked about was you know calling all boats um, to get everybody in the area to start picking people out of the water there were some other things about rafts and things that we looked at too but that was one of the, the main so we said okay well we've got that in our back pocket during some of the big events that have happened in New York the op sales and uh, things like that. We've had plans on where to have um, triage points and, uh, you know, for uh, ambulances to be able to pull up and, and do triage. And we've had them scattered throughout the port, Jersey side, Brooklyn, Staten Island, et cetera. Um, and we said, well, we can get those stood up because we, we were expecting a lot of casualties, a lot of injuries, shall we say, not necessarily casualties, but injuries um, after this. And, uh, so we, had, we were talking all this. We all went down to the pilot boat. We got on. Um, the call was made by, uh, you know, to calling all boats. And uh, we went down uh, and stood off the battery basically with um, myself, Mike Day, and a few others to um, kind of try to coordinate all those boats to the different places. We put um, people ashore, uh, Coast Guard people ashore so that they could um, – report back everyone at VHF radios. We put people on Pier 11 at the battery, et cetera, so that we could kind of figure out where to send boats. And uh, and so that's, so we kind of stood off Manhattan um, and we did that as uh, Peter said, basically through the night. And then 
the next step was, well, how do we resupply Manhattan? Because now you've got everyone, everything coming in. So the next week was spent, um, you know, which even less people know about than the, than the boat lift is, you know, everything went in out of Manhattan by boat for the next week. Uh, all the bridges were shut, all the tunnels were shut. Everything went in and out of lower Manhattan by boat. I mean, all the acetylene, all the oxygen, all the water, all the food, all the equipment, everything went in and out by boat. Um, so that, you know, that was something that happened for the next week. So, uh, you know, until they got everything else back together again. But again, you know, I think, uh, you know, as, as Mariners, you know, you heard Frank and you heard Peter, you know, they just, their minds just click and it's okay, this is what we have to do and this is what we're going to do and this is how, this is how we're going to do it, so. Right, and we were supposed to uh, use the ferry boats to take all those casualties back to the Staten Island ballpark, which is supposed to be set up as triage, but that never happened. No. Because the casualties just never came. Yeah. You know, everyone was either basically fine or dead. There was, you know, very few, you know, injuries. But we had, we brought doctors over and I mean, you know, it was all set up, um, you know, and then the, the coordination with the boats and everyone just wanted to help, even like small dive boats. You know, there are a lot of dive operations going around the port during the, during the day that people don't realize. So you had a lot of scuba divers there in small boats. They're like, what can we do to help? Well, like, as Peter said, one of the things we were really worried about, especially at, you know, at the battery wall and places like that, were people falling in. Uh, you, had to, you had to climb over rails and things like that. And we just asked them, well, listen, you know, you're a safety boat. You go, you know, you go here, you go there, you go there. And if anything happens, you know, you've got the swimmers, you've got the equipment, you know, help. And they were like, great, no problem. You know, that's what we'll do. So, I mean, everybody helped from the small boat that really couldn't take people, um, you know, right up to the, you know, the tugboats, the ferries, the fishing boats, I mean, the dinner boats, everybody. Yeah. And the, and the weeks after that, uh for myself, I was running the Kennedy between Governor's Island and Whitehall because I, that's where they had the National Guard station. They brought in all their um, heavy equipment and stuff like that. And uh, that was it. Just get up, uh, go to Staten Island, pick up the boat, bring it to Manhattan, shuttle uh, the Army between uh, Governor's Island and, Stat and Whitehall Terminal. Right. right. Um, well, uh, I want to thank all, all three of you uh, so much for, for sharing your story. And we're going we're gonna to come back to you at the end of the program, but I do want to give our other panelists an opportunity um, to share their stories as well. So if you have any questions uh, for Andrew or Peter or Frank, um, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, and we, we can also um, uh, get to those at the end of the show. We're going to bring everybody uh, back together. But, but thank you all so much. Um, for what you did um, on that day, but also for, for sharing your story today. Um, so we're going to shift gears uh, a little bit right now, and we're going to invite um, our uh, the, the Coast Guard side of the house um, to come in and share uh, their experience um, and tr introduce this, uh, this panel. Um, we are uh, joined um, by uh, Vice Admiral Michael uh, McAllister. Um, who is the Deputy Commandant for Mission Support, currently stationed uh, at U.S. Coast Guard Headquarters uh, in, in Washington, D.C. So, Admiral, thank you so much for, for joining us. Yeah, hey, uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to the Transportation Institute, the New York Council, the Navy League, and Turnstile Tours for uh, hosting this, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting us to, uh, to join in. I figured I'd offer just a couple of uh, opening comments and then uh, turn it over to my, uh, my colleagues. But uh, let me start by saying that Andrew, Peter, and Frank are, are uh, understating and being humble uh, about their involvement. When I think about the, the role of the maritime industry, the ferries, the tugs, the pilots, uh, you know, they assisted hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people on 9-11, saved a lot of lives by conducting safe and uh, rapid evacuation of the island of, uh, of Manhattan. And, uh, you know, it, it was a scary time for everybody. The, we weren't sure, you know, uh, how the, uh, the towers, uh, you know, it was always kind of the threat of the tower collapse and what impact that might have on the waterfront. There was a uh, risk of other terrorist uh, uh, actions there. You know, by that time, uh, the plane hit the uh, Pentagon. There was another one in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And so, you know, their ability to come together in a time of great uh, uh, uncertainty 
uh, is certainly admirable. They, the other uh, partners that I wanted to mention that uh, came together uh, like, like no other time before were uh, some of the law enforcement and emergency services uh, folks in the area like the Port Authority Police Department, uh, of course, NYPD, FDNY, New Jersey State Police. And this was really a catalyzing event for, uh, for getting everybody to, uh, to work together and frankly, to be stronger together. Now, I'm, I might be a little bit biased, but uh, you know, I'm particularly proud of uh, some of the Coast Guard uh, actions that day as well. Uh, Andrew mentioned uh, Lieutenant Mike Day. Now, uh, Admiral Select uh, Mike Day, I get to work with him. Um, and a variety of others. Uh, and then they too, you know, kind of despite the uncertainty of, uh, of the event, had uh, what we call a bias for action and uh, exercised what we call on-scene initiative uh, to, to, to help uh, both safely and rapidly evacuate hundreds of thousands of people that day. And, and as the team had already said, the panel before, you know, moving response equipment uh, into New York uh, was uh, was part of our mission as well. The Coast Guard team actually grew uh, in the first 48 hours up to uh, about 2,500 people from 143 different units around the country, just kind of assets and people pouring in uh, to the New York, uh, New Jersey area, 60 cutters, uh, an aircraft. And of course, you know, we've talked about the evacuation, we've talked about the response effort and, and bringing uh, first responders into the city, but there was also a pretty large uh, port security uh, uh, operation going on over the next really close to 60 days. So, you know, this was one of the largest waterborne evacuations ever done. Uh, this was also one of the largest port security operations uh, since World War II. Um, and, you know, I would offer that Coast Guard members continued to uh, demonstrate uh, the adaptability, the ingenuity to, uh, to try to get the port reopened as quickly as possible to get uh, goods and services moving, but really to do so in the, a new normal of, uh, of homeland and port security. And uh, just um, of interest, uh, the, the way that uh, the Coast Guard was structured in New York um, ended up being the, the Coast Guard wide model that was adapted uh, about two years later uh, when Congress acted to, uh, to put into place the Maritime Transportation Security Act. And I was uh, particularly proud, uh, obviously, to be part of that team. If, if you could indulge me, I, I just wanted to mention uh, three people uh, by name specifically. So one was uh, Rear Admiral Dick Bennis. He was our commanding officer uh, there at uh, Coast Guard Activities New York. Uh, everybody you know, who worked the waterfront in uh, New York uh, knows Admiral Bennis well. Uh, one of the Coast Guard's best leaders. You, know, you think about uh, right person, right time. Uh, right place. Uh, he, he was the one. And he's since passed. Uh, I had the great privilege uh, as the captain of the port uh, down in Charleston, South Carolina, a few years later to uh, dedicate the entrance channel in his name. So if you enter the port of Charleston, you go through the Rear Admiral Richard Bennis uh, channel. The other two people I wanted to mention were uh, Petty Officer Vincent Dan, uh, Dan's and Petty Officer Jeffrey Palazzo. So uh, many of the people, Coast Guard people who turned out were reservists and uh, Petty Officer Dan's was um, Coast Guard reservist but worked full time with uh, NYPD, Petty Officer Palazzo, uh, also a reservist but worked full time with FDNY and um, they lost their lives uh, that day uh, in, in the, the conduct of the, you know, the missions they were on and their rescues. And uh, just uh, recently, the Coast Guard announced that we're gonna name two of our newest cutters, Coast Guard cutters, uh, after Petty Officer Dan's and Petty Officer Palazzo. Uh, we decided to name an entire class of cutters after Coast Guard enlisted heroes and uh, their names came to the top of the list. And so we look forward to, uh, to dedicating those shortly. So I guess with that, I'll, uh, you know, probably a good time to, to hand it to my, uh, my esteemed colleagues, Dan Croce, uh, John Hillen and Dan Ronan, who I think uh, can provide some pretty compelling kind of personal witness to uh, some of the events from that day. Great. Well, well th thank you so much uh, for those remarks and, and providing that, that, that background. Um, I want to bounce it over first to, uh, uh, to Dan Croce, if you, if you want to uh, turn on your, your sound and, and video. Um, I want to turn it to you because you were actually experiencing um, this a, a little bit differently because you had just become a reservist. Is that right? So you were uh, on your way to your, your civilian job. Um, 
at the at the time. Yes, as a matter of fact, I I had just finished three years active duty at Activities New York, where I worked alongside uh, Mike McAllister, uh, who just spoke, um, uh, Dan Ronan, who's going to be speaking, and 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 some of the others. Uh, so I just left my my uh, three years active duty as a reserve officer and started a new job in lower Manhattan in the marine insurance industry. I was very excited to be working in, in lower Manhattan in a new position. My, of, my office actually, uh, looking out my office windows, I could see the World Trade Centers clearly. Um, after the first plane had hit, um, I contacted Activities New York and spoke to Commander Bobel, offered my assistance, said I'm down here um, in close proximity to this disaster. What can I do to help? We got disconnected because the second jet had hit and um, building shook, big explosion. He said, I got to go. I said, me too. So uh, I got together with my office colleagues um, and we all decided it was best to evacuate our building. When we got to the street level, we realized that um, the subways were closed, there was no mass transit, and also had heard that the bridges and tunnels were all closed. So our senior management suggested, he said, you know, we should all go down to the Battery Park where we'll be safe away from tall buildings because basically no one knew it was going to happen next. So we all ventured down to Battery Park. Uh, while we were heading down that way, uh, some people were running in a panic mode. Others had just come up from the subways and uh, didn't know what was happening and they were, they, because they had just come out of the underground. Um, so there, there were so many people flooding Battery Park. Um, and seeing such mass humanity with nowhere to go, I, I knew the only way out for all these people that were there was a water evacuation. So I wanted to inform the Coast Guard Command Center uh, what I had seen and observed, and there was a need to send vessels to evacuate all the stranded people in Manhattan. Uh, but my cell phone wouldn't connect to the command center. I was very close to the Coast Guard Battery Park building. So I said, hey, you know, I'm gonna go in there, maybe a landline would be better. So I went into the Battery Park Coast Guard building, used a landline, but to no avail. Every number I called, they either got a voice message or, or it, it was a busy signal. So I thought, who else can I call that's on base? And I remembered uh, Chief Warrant Officer Brian Willard had worked for me in my job there at the Coast Guard, and he was home recovering from a recent surgery. So I called him, got him on the phone. I calmly explained what was happening in Lower Manhattan, and the need for him to go up to the command center, to physically go there because he can't get through by phone, uh, relay my message to Commander Ronan in the command center that there's a need to, to send boats uh, to help evacuate people. Um, and, and Brian said, aye, aye, sir. And this was all before the towers had collapsed. So I was still in the Battery Park building and um, was there when the first tower ended up collapsing. But shortly before that, I did notice the New York waterways boats were, were taking people off the seawall, which wasn't an area where um, you normally would, 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 would uh, load or embark uh, personnel because there was no ramp there, but they were very carefully helping people that were climbing over the fence and uh, the railing and, and helping them on board. But then this, the, the first building had collapsed. When that happened, it was total darkness. It was like day turned into night. And that's when I, I could hear more commotion and see that some people were panicking, trying to get on the New York Waterways boats. Um, a little later on, the dust had settled and um, I was looking out the window and I saw the pilot boat in New York heading from the upper uh, bay of the harbor toward Battery Park. There were uh, some towing vessels and, and some smaller, uh, small passenger vessels behind, pretty much in a, in a V formation. It was a sight to see. And all I could think of was uh, they got my message um, that we needed more boats and, and help was on the way. Um, a, lot, a lot of people in the maritime industry and in the Coast Guard did a lot of great things that day. And I'm forever grateful for how everybody worked so well together and formed uh, a team that helped evacuate so many people out of Manhattan. Yeah, and, and on that point, why don't we bounce it over to, uh, to Dan Ronan, if you wanna tell us a little bit about that, that decision to call all boats um, 
and, and how, how everything went down um, at the Coast Guard base in Staten Island. Sure, thank you, Andrew. Um, it was, uh, you know, as you can imagine from uh, my colleagues who've talked already, it was a pretty surreal time uh, trying to look at what was going on and, and what we needed to do to respond effectively. Uh, Dan's information was absolutely critical to get to us. Uh, we knew that uh, there was a disaster unfolding in lower Manhattan, but we didn't know the extent of the people that were out the, at the battery needing to be moved. We had heard that New York Waterways was moving people. We knew that Staten Island Ferry was moving people. Uh, Dan getting the message to Brian Willard to come up to the command center. I remember sitting there with Andrew McGovern, uh, Mike Day, uh, Captain Pat Harris, who was our deputy at the time, uh, and Commander Mark Vobel, all of us were sitting there together going, okay, we're gonna have to get some type of coordinated response. And Andrew greatly offered up the New York pilot boat to be that on-scene command boat, which proved critical for the overall success of that day. So we did make the call for all boats. Uh, we quickly followed that up though with a call for all commercial boats. We kind of made a conscious decision that we wanted the professional mariners of New York, of which there are many and who are very talented, to be that workforce uh, to move uh, the people that day because we knew how difficult it is. Anybody familiar with the waterway in New York knows that the currents, especially around the battery, are very strong. And if you are not a seasoned mariner, you can get yourself in trouble. So we put out the call for all boats. Uh, it was echoed uh, throughout by, by everybody. Um, and it was just a phenomenal time. And, and while that was happening, as the director of the Vessel Traffic Service, we shut down all other commercial traffic in New York Harbor. I have some special uh, regulatory authorities as the director of the Vessel Traffic Service, which allows me to create safety and security zones uh, from, a, from a vessel movement perspective. Uh, so we were able to do that very quickly uh, to keep the whole waterway pretty much safe and focused on the movement of people off of Lower Manhattan. Hmm. And as some other people mentioned, you know, we wanted to do everything you could to avoid compounding this tragedy with a, with a maritime accident. It's clear, you know, how many people you can safely put on a ferry. How do you know how many safely people you can put safely onto, say, a tugboat um, that shows up? Right. So this is where our marine inspectors from the Coast Guard uh, came, in, came in handy. They, so many of them volunteer to go to Lower Manhattan. These are people who are very familiar with stability um, and the rules and regulations, and they work closely with every vote, boat that came up to the seawall and said, all right, here's the number that we think you should take. Take this and go. So it, it was kind of on the fly, but with well-educated um, marine inspectors who made risk-based decisions that proved out to be very, very effective. Yeah, I think that's such an important point because I think um, you can get the impression that this is sort of a, a free for all, but it was very, you know, having such a, you know, professional mariners as well as all the folks on the Coast Guard side was so critical to the success. Yeah. And one more quick point with, as Andrew McGovern said, this didn't happen by circumstance. Our Harbor Safety Committee, our Harbor Ops Committee spent a lot of time talking about different things that we would need to do in the in the community, but we also had a year before that the International Naval Review in Opsail 2000, of which we spent a whole year planning for contingencies that might affect Lower Manhattan. And one of those was how could we move a half a million people from Lower Manhattan if there was some type of attack during the International Naval Review in the Opsail? And we had actually got together as a large group and had a tabletop exercise where we talked through all of the challenges that we would face. And I will tell you that. On this day, we didn't have to dust off that plan. People from all segments of the maritime industry just enacted it, and that is why it was such a, such a successful boat lift. Wow. Um, well, I want to also bring into the conversation uh, John Hillen um, and get get your perspective, also, you know, from from Staten Island um, on the events of the day, but also what happened uh, in the days and weeks uh, that followed, and the ways in which it it really you know, transformed um, the harbor and, and the port of New York? Yeah, as, as Dan had mentioned, um, they closed the port just about right away, right after the second plane went into the tower. But as quick as they closed the port, they actually um, 
directed us to start thinking about reopening the port. You know, um, you know, port's closing, five minutes later, start work working on reopening. And as Andrew mentioned about the relationships, that was very key in being able to pull that together. We were able to uh, get the port moving securely and safely in just a couple of days. And, um, and it seemed, uh, you know, because of the cooperation with customs, immigration, we work very closely. Office of Naval Intelligence got involved with us. We work very closely with Naval Weapon Station Earl. Uh, when we had certain issues we had to deal with, we got inspectors, as uh, Admiral McAllister mentioned, people from all over the country coming in to help work with us. We had container inspectors from our unit, from Oklahoma, Minnesota, uh, you know, everywhere, Puerto Rico, uh, coming up here and working with us. And, and they were opening up every single container. So we. Um, so we really mounted a, a plan and really on the day that it happened, in addition to helping uh, Lieutenant Commander Fish, who was our acting division chief or department or inspections division chief at the time, I also was involved in just trying to put together a straw man plan that we uh, proposed to Admiral Bennis that evening along with uh, Commander, now Admiral McAllister. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and what were those, what were those, you know, the, the, they, what's so amazing to me is that you were able to reopen the port so rapidly. So, so you know, what were those those days like? Um, you know, because all of a sudden, I, I, it just blows my mind that you know, opening every single container that comes into the port of New York just seems like such a a monumental task. Yeah, that was a monumental task. We had to uh, work very close, closely with customs, and we did it together jointly with them. Uh, opening up every container. Eventually, they came out with the National Guard assisting us in opening the containers as well. Um, I guess fortunately and unfortunately, traffic was down immediately right after the attacks, and it slowly increased. So the first few days, the traffic wasn't as significant. The, you know, a lot of the ships diverted to other ports, uh, container ships as well as cruise ship that actually diverted to Boston. Um, the other challenge was, and, and I think Andrew kind of mentioned it, but the Sandy Hook pilots played a big role in um, you know, providing a lot of guidance. Right now we have what they call ma Marine Transportation uh, System Recovery Unit. That didn't really exist back then, but on 9-11, that was pretty much us talking with the Sandy Hook pilots saying, okay, who do we take in next based on tide restrictions and so forth and trying to maximize the absolute number of vessels we can get in. Um, you know, maybe one vessel can wait because they're not tide restricted where we'll get another vessel ahead of that. And that was significant with Sandy Hook pilots who eventually as traffic increased, had us actually live on board their vessels offshore, boarding them, um, and that was a huge assistance as well because we were able to get to we we boarded every you know Admiral Bennis wanted boots on the deck of everything that was coming into the port right after that, and we uh, and we managed to pull that off and that you know that couldn't have happened without the pilots without customs without uh, and uh, without the assistance of all the other Coast Guard folks and the reservists that were stationed here and stationed throughout the United States Coast Guard. Uh, couldn't have pulled it off. They came here and they, uh, and we adapted a plan that never existed before, really. I mean, it was kind of new. We had to figure out, all right, how are we going to go about doing this? What are we going to do? And, um, and really, it was a lot of input from a lot of people, a lot of expertise coming from people who are familiar in law enforcement and so forth, that we were able to put together a plan that was logical without taking 20 hours to board the vessel, you know, something that was quick to be able to make a judgment call. In addition, I didn't mention, but immigration provided an officer that actually worked right outside uh, with our arrivals desk, screening every vessel arrival. Uh, immigration officers were screening, screening every crew member on board every single vessel as well, 96 hours in advance. Um, at the time, there was no, uh, the notice of arrival system has evolved. So now there's a system that it gets, it, it gets sent to, and it's much better managed. But back then, everything was being faxed into the captain of the ports, and we were dealing with arrival notices through faxes. And amazingly, that system that exists today, they actually got up and running around the end of October, November, which is, which is amazing that they're able to get such a complex system going so quickly. But those first, first few months, a month and a half, we had to, uh, we had to work off fax machines, but um, we got it done. And just so I have this timeline right, because I, I just want to emphasize it to people. So September 11th was, was a Tuesday. You were reopening the port on Thursday. Is that right? Yeah, the, the Admiral was reopening on Thursday morning. Yeah, Amazing. which is which is earth shattering, you know, but there was a lot, a lot going on behind the scenes. A lot of people question, why are you doing it so quickly? You should shut down for two weeks. But I think most of the people on this conference probably would agree that shutting this port down for two weeks was is not a good option. But we 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 opened it, the port opened, the Admiral opened it, and it was safer and more secure and more efficient. And, and the partnerships that we've already had existing 
we're even stronger at this point because we're all have you all work towards a team effort. Mm -hmm. um, well, again, th thank you to all of you. Um, in the few minutes we have left, I, I want to open it up to um, to all of our panelists um, for for these last few questions, um, and also invite um, again any of our um, attendees if if you have any uh, questions as as we wrap up. Um, I mean, the main question I want to ask is we we talked a lot about how preparation was key and that there were these partnerships and collaborations in place that really helped the boat lift operation be so successful. Um, but I, I'd like to hear from um, anyone who'd like to volunteer, you know, ways in which you've seen the port change um, in the last 20 years. What, what have we learned um, in, in the last 19 years um, that has really transformed the Port of New York since, um, since uh, September 11th? As Andrew McGovern, I mean, I would just like to say that um, I don't know if it's changed that much. I think, I, I think just as John just said, you know, going through what we went through, and um, and doing it the way we did it, and and the way everything worked out, um, was um, the only. Uh, it just kind of we all had some really good partnerships, and they just got better. So I think that's the real uh, point to this. I mean, you know, this, none of this worked in a vacuum. I mean, you know, the, you know, the civilian side and the Coast Guard side and the customs side and the law enforcement side, all of that was one. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't this, you know, everyone worked together, everybody, you know, there, there was just this, you know, just, you know, a job had to get done and it got done. And, you know, the rule books went out the window, Basically, you know, I mean, as, as was said before, you know, you had a risk-based system, you know, you were like, okay, you know, a tugboat may only be certificate, certificated for, you know, 30 people, but we put 100 people on there because we knew that we could. And, uh, you know, we needed to move those people. So it was, you know, it, it just, I think it just made everything work better uh, than it did even before. And it was working great before that. So, I mean... You know, other than all the rules and regulations that, you know, normally, you know, move forward, you know, and things, you know, those all change. But as far as the, the port working as one, I think that's still, you know, is better than it was before 9-11. Yeah, I would like to just add, uh, I agree with Andrew and everything he said, but um, they did come out with the Marine Transportation Security Act that came out in like 2004. And, and what that did, again, it, it brought together people that were already working together even before 9-11. But, uh, but it had us all speaking the same security language, you know, more SEC levels and so forth. And I think that is a big change that came out of uh, the 9-11 the events. Um, we have a question here from Jordan. Um, and they ask, uh, during a historically awful day um, for, for everyone, um, what gave you a boost? Uh, what inspired you or, or uplift you to get through uh, what I know for many of you were from some very, very long days and, and nights. Um, so again, uh, anyone who'd like to volunteer to, sh to share. I think, uh, uh, for me, I would say that it, it was a sense of, of, of patriotism, a sense that you, you knew that this was an attack on, on us and our country, and you just worked hard with everyone. I, 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 ended up coming back on active duty and worked with the Port Authority and uh, down in the port with the customs and uh, involved with container inspections and, and uh, a lot of law enforcement, uh, state, local, and on the federal side. And everyone just worked together. We knew we had a job. It was the early phases of Homeland Security. We didn't have a Department of Homeland Security yet. And uh, we were all acting um, in, in, in that capacity. And um, you just you just worked and, and, and did what you thought you needed to do. Um, there were some things that you, you never thought that you, you, you could get accomplished, but you did it because you had, you had the drive to do it because we were all working together for one cause to keep our nation safe. And, and I know, uh, Frank, you want to add something, but Dan, I just want to um, ask you, you had a little bit of a different experience because you were helping in ways that you could with coordination, but you also were, were a passenger on the boat lift as well. Yes, I, I was. I was very fortunate. I actually uh, 
here you are in, in, a, in a large disaster. I bumped into someone I knew, a, a state policeman I worked with in uh, my Coast Guard capacity, uh, uh, Officer Borelli. He was on a, a Marine police boat and he ended up getting me a ride with a New York, a New Jersey uh, state police from Manhattan to Hoboken later on that day. And you, got a, you got a police escort, but you still had to uh, undergo a decontamination shower, right? Exactly. Everything was set up. We had to go through the decontamination shower. We, we got screened in, in Hoboken by, by medical uh, staff. Um, and then they, uh, you know, handed us all uh, tablecloths to keep us warm because everybody who went through there uh, from the boat lift, um, you know, had to, had to go through the showers just to be sure that we had whatever had fallen from the towers off of us. Mm -hmm. um, and Frank Peters, was there something you want to add? Well, I was just going to echo what Dan said about the heightened uh, patriotism of the country, the sense of duty and obligation to go to work and just uh, keep the city moving. You know, we pulling all those people off of Manhattan, uh, they were all covered with dust and debris on the ferry boats, the deckhands on the boat, and, and even the engineers coming up from the engine room, uh, coming up to assist and make sure that everybody had water, everything they needed to, to help them feel comfortable. They had just been through a, a horrible ordeal. But in the weeks uh, after the attack, yeah, just everybody working together so well, patriot, patriotism was riding high in the country. And, uh, you know, as a Navy veteran, I, uh, I felt that obligation to, to go to work and just be the best person I could be for my crew. And, uh, you know, to always let them know that, that I appreciated their service as well. Yeah. Um, we, we have one more kind of technical question, um, which is um, how did you coordinate the, the refueling of vessels? Um, uh, well, I, can, I think I can answer that. We, again, went back to that trust that we had with everybody. Um, as people were getting low on fuel and other boats had fuel, they just offered, okay, what you, you need 500 gallons, I can give you 500 gallons, you know, and worry about the bills later. I mean, and that's pretty much how it went. I mean, you know, if somebody was getting low, then somebody else was able to fuel them up. Um, the other thing, which a lot, again, a lot of people don't realize is all the fire engines in Manhattan, so all the water mains in Manhattan were gone. You know, you can imagine, you know, when the towers collapsed and made a big hole, the water mains went too. So the only way we could get water to the fires in, on the pile was um, from the river. So we had fire boats, um, you know, docked along uh, the west side of Manhattan with hoses up, and then you have to relay through pumper, through pumper trucks to keep the water pressure up and get in, into the middle of the island. Well, those pumper trucks don't, ca you know, don't carry that much fuel. So mariners, were we were literally putting um, diesel fuel into five-gallon water jugs and carrying it and dumping it into fire engines for the next few days. I mean, that's how, um, and again, nobody asked about, you know, like, oh, am I going to get the money for the, you know, for the, for the fuel that was just like, it needs to get done. So it got done. I mean, that's, again, that's yeah. back to the argument. What if that has to get done, it's going to get done, you know? Yeah. Uh, I know we're over time, but I, I just want to mention a, a couple of other things here. Um, we had a question, um, and I think, Peter, maybe you can feel this one, which was about um, how the, uh, basically, it was very difficult to load and unload those ferries along the seawall and along the, the short piers. Has that improved? Would it, if we had to do, God forbid, an evacuation like this, um, today in Lower Manhattan, would it, would it be easier? Well, it wouldn't be easier to do it uh, from the seawalls. Uh, that, that still is bad uh, because, you know, the, the way the ferry uh, terminals work is they are, the barges are set at the same level as the ferries. So as the tides go up and down, they go up and down together. And so when a ferry pulls in, it's right at the same level as the barge. And um, when you get a low tide, you've got to go from the, you know, from the, over the fencing and then down onto the boat. Um, it, it's never a good thing. It's, it's, an, it's an emergency option. You don't do it, you know, that's why we stopped doing that as soon as the air cleared and we can go back to using the barge because especially for moving any kind of numbers of people, it's, it's a much better option. Um, we also had someone who, who made a comment um, 
about the role of the, uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary um, in helping with the evacuation. I don't know if any of our Coast Guard representatives want to want to comment on that. Sure, I'll field that. Um, the Coast Guard Auxiliary played a huge role, especially when it came to reaching out to the uh, boating public, you know, played a tremendous role in that case of, um, you know, uh, I know Admiral Collins came out with America's Waterway Watch, which I, well, that was around 2005 or four, I'm not sure exactly the year, but, um, but the, the auxiliary played a huge role in that, but they were doing a lot of that even right after 9-11. They, uh, they got engaged in just keeping the boating public aware of um, where to go, where not to go, and, and the coin of what Admiral Lloyd had said back then, maritime domain awareness. If they see something out of the ordinary, let us know. Um, I'm sure they provided other assets as well, but my direct uh, interaction with the auxiliary was they were a huge asset, and there's five, 600 marinas in our AOR. So, uh, so they were huge at getting out to a very important public, uh, boating, uh, waterway public. Great. Well, um, like I said, we're, we're over time here, um, but I want to give everyone the opportunity if you have any other uh, comments, um, recollections, uh, takeaways uh, that, that you'd like to share, um, please, uh, please share them with us. Um, and I just want to thank all of uh, our, our uh, attendees today for asking your wonderful questions. I wish we could get to all of them. We, we've, had, uh, we've had so many. Um, so this has been really, really fantastic. Um, and I, I guess I just want to share the expression um, that we've been getting from everybody here. Just incredible thanks and, and gratitude um, for what you did on that day, but also helping us um, to commemorate this day in, in a special way and, and remember again a, a story that is not often told. So, so thank you so much to everybody for participating today. Um, I want to give a, again a, a special thanks um, to the Transportation Institute uh, and to the Navy League uh, New York Council for helping to, to pull this together and everybody's um, respective positions and of course to the Coast Guard um, for helping with this, uh, with this event today. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, Frank, you'd like to uh, you, you'd like to make some remarks um, about how people can stay engaged and uh, and support the Navy League and help to support all the sea services. Absolutely, Andrew. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all our panelists for joining us tonight, Transportation Institute, for their generous sponsorship of the event, and Turnstile Tours for producing and managing this. I'd like to definitely thank everyone who joined us tonight. And let me tell you just a second about the Navy League for those who are not familiar. We are a citizen run organization that supports the sea services, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and US flag Merch Marine through a combination of advocacy and education, advocacy to our elected officials, education to the general public, support of active duty, reserve, and members and their families here in the New York area, as well as the USS New York and also youth programs supporting the Junior Rossi, Navy and Marine Corps Junior Rossi programs in New York high schools, the Sea Cadets and Young Marines. We invite everyone on this call who's not a member to join us and continue and show that support. Um, go, please go to nynavyleague.org uh, for membership. And I'd also like to mention that in a couple of weeks, in about two weeks, we have a three-part series on shipbuilding for the United States Navy from Brooklyn to the bayous. And being a guy from New Orleans, I'm very familiar with the bayous area and the shipyards down there. We invite you to, to register for the event and join us for this exciting three-part series. Again, produced and moderated by Turnstile Tours. Once again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Everyone, please stay safe and have a good evening and pleasant weekend. Thank you.